did this teeter totter yesterday afternoon to homesteading. So today we're going to be focusing on homesteading, automating your homestead, training homestead dogs, and then defense, strategic defense. And we're going to do gardening. So the day all kind of works. It's why I wore my, my pumpkin grenade for the homesteading. <laughs> so the first session is all about how to train your homestead animals. And who better to teach it than the one who already taught, taught us how to make our dogs sit and stay and all of those things and wait and teach one skill at a time and realize sometimes you think you're teaching one skill and you're teaching three and the poor animal is confused. So who better to do that than Joel Riles? I'm going to hand it straight over to you because I've already told them who you are once. So, so uh, you guys already know who I am. One of the things that's worth mentioning is on the canine side, the stuff we're about to go over uh, is essentially the outline for my uh, creating the perfect homestead dog portion of canine academy so if you want to see the visuals and actually have the full like explanation with the dog going through the training um that will be up there i'm shooting for it being fully live by february but it uh, will be starting to film on that pretty much immediately and some of that stuff of course will be teased on the social media and things like that but i uh, just wanted you to know that that's where the actual like here's a dog here's us doing the specific training and um, also, my wife said I have to announce this out so that if somebody out there knows how to auto-generate captions that are translated into a language that whoever around the world is watching it automatically, uh, if you know how to do that, get with me afterwards because we're trying to see if Canine Academy can be pushed out to other countries, but obviously I only speak English. All right, so let's move on to that. So what is a homestead dog? What can you expect from a homestead dog? So we are not talking about livestock guardian dogs specifically. Now, you could take a livestock guardian dog breed and, and do the training as a homestead dog. But a dog, livestock guardian dog lives with the animals, right? If you're bringing your LGD in at night, that dog is not doing its job as a livestock guardian dog because it's not with the animals, right? So they live with the animals 24 seven. That's their job. That's what a livestock guardian dog does. And it's also a very specific set of skills you're expecting that dog to do, right? If you had, for instance, a protection dog, well, the protection dog spends all of its time with you, right? Because if it's not with you, it can't protect you. And so wherever you would go, the dog would move with you. So the homestead dog for someone who is homesteading is kind of in between that a little bit. So they have a few tasks. They have a few tasks that lean into guarding the property or their people. And then there's other tasks of things that you need to do on a regular basis that either the dog needs to not get in the way, right? Like if I'm driving my ATV around, I don't want my dog jumping in front trying to bite the tires every time I have to move somewhere, right? So they either need to not get in the way, they need to help. Or they need to just kind of have that, hey, I'm going to keep watch over you or over the flock while you do this thing so that they're an extra set of eyes, right? And uh, we'll be getting into that a little bit more. So it's important that as a general rule, my view on this is, and of course, everybody can have variations of this, right? But this is, is my view, is with you, they're well-mannered. Uh, with other animals, especially yours, but also if you know friends come over, people come over, depending on how commercial you are, um, they can assist in moving the animals, but they're generally not herders. Now, if you get a hardcore herder, like a healer or a, a border collie or something like that, um, you better give those dogs a job. And they tend to do great with fur animals or wool animals, like hooves, but they tend to not do as good with feathered animals. So just kind of keep that kind of stuff in mind. Um, dogs will also assist in protecting you from some of your more dangerous livestock, right? So the reason smaller animals is because they're not as dangerous. Um, if you're trying to move a cow, cows can be really dangerous if you're trying to make them do something they don't want to do, right? And um, so something that is a little bit more protective, some of your hardcore healer dogs, if, especially if they've been bred to still move those types of animals, um, your Malinois, things like that, will come in and freaking smash a cow if it's pushing their person, right? And over the years, thankfully, I've never had it happen to me, but we've moved a lot of cattle with the dogs. And, uh, and I've seen guys get pinned into like a, a post, 
with the cow and the cow just goes, boom, you're not doing that to me. And to the cow, it's nothing. It's essentially death if the dog didn't come up and smash him in the nose and then the cow moves and now the person's free. So they can provide that service as well. And we'll get into a little bit about how to how to create the uh, temperament in the dogs to do that. Um, and then we talked about how to help or at least not slow down with a lot of the other jobs that you do. Um, to alert and bark if people are around that aren't supposed to be there, right? So strangers can be, hey, that's a strange animal that I don't think should be out here. I'm going to let you know it's here. To, hey, there's somebody at the front gate. And, you know, I'm letting my people know that they're there, right? So alerting and barking to strangers. And the reason we went over the core obedience, most of the stuff we're going to go over here, you can do some of it without having core obedience in your dog, but it's going to be frustrating. It's going to uh, take longer and your end results are probably not going to be as good. So what I base all of the stuff that we do on is the foundation is there. And that's what we call it. Typically, the foundation in our thinking is the first year of the dog's life. So I get the dog and whatever you do for that first year, this is one of the reasons that getting a rescue could be great or terrible, right? Because if the dog's over a year old, that foundation's already in the dog. So whatever happened to that dog in the first year of its life is going to be and you can make it better, right? If you, you're getting a dog that was kicked or just abandoned and ignored, uh, you can improve on the foundation a little bit, but you're going to be limited by whatever that foundation is, right? So if you get your dog as a young dog and then you start doing the foundational training with them right off the bat, your obedience will come in faster. Your bond will be stronger with you and your family. And then if there's anything screwed up with the dog, it's probably your fault. So at least you don't have anyone else to blame for it, right? But I highly encourage putting at least uh, your, your basic foundational obedience into the dog before you try and do a lot of this stuff. So, for instance, well, we'll get into a lot of the, the more details as we go through. Because you guys don't need them. I do or I'll run off on a tangent somewhere. All right. So how do you select a homestead dog? So when we're talking about protection dogs and things like that, a lot of times, you know, people are like, well, can you do Doberman for protection dogs or can you do this? And I'm like, I work with these three breeds. Here's why I work with them. And, um, and here's why I don't work with a lot of other breeds, right? When we're talking about a homestead dog, it, it's much more broad in terms of the dogs that can be brought into this. There's a lot of mixed dogs. Uh, so this is where, you know, going to a rescue and getting a puppy. And I, I do recommend a puppy if you go to a rescue, like, um, you know, and, and again, it's a little bit of a crapshoot, but the, we're not talking about dogs that are so highly specialized that to do the job, right? There are some genetics that we might want to avoid. And um, so when I'm looking for a homestead dog to select, I generally like the medium to like medium large, right? So when I say large, large is like over a hundred pounds. If your dog's over a hundred pounds, they're going to be limited in some things that they can do, right? Because they're, they're just so big. Now they're, they're going to do better at other things too, right? Like if you have cows having a hundred pound Malinois, might be really good for making that cow leave you alone. And once a dog smashes a cow like that, especially if it's a problem cow that likes to do stuff off and on, that dog gets in front of the cow and just I was like right now, right? So it's like you've established a pattern there. And then when that dog is there, it's there to help. So um, medium to larger dogs without going excessive is kind of your ideal size range, right? The smaller dogs, they're, so um, when I say smaller dogs, I mean like little dogs like this, right? Most of those dogs, you got to remember every breed that exists. And so, and then, therefore the cross breeds that we look at, but you, you still, if you go back to where, when they were a breed that was being used for something, every breed was created to do something. Nobody had pets 200 years ago, even royalty and the Kings and all that kind of stuff. Their dogs still had a job to do. Right? Maybe they hung out by the fireplace, but when we went hunting on horseback for pigs, those dogs were the dogs running the pigs, right? And if they weren't doing that job or couldn't do that job, then they got rid of them because they weren't worth having. So the small dogs had a purpose, and that predominantly was rodent control. So they would use them for rats and for other rodents. And so that's why a lot of times they'll refer to small dogs as ratters, and people kind of think that as a negative term. That's what most of like chihuahuas and things like that, that was their job was to find and kill rats, okay? So they do great for that, but not so great for most of the other things. So personally, I prefer cats for that, 
because I can feed them half as much as they need where the main thing I want them to guard is, which is my pallets of dog food that I have. And they get half a feeding there every morning. So they know to come there and then they kind of hang around and then they'll go hunt through the day, but then they come back because that's where the food's going to come the next morning. And then they make sure there's no mice and stuff messing around with it. And then I just got to make sure that my dog is okay with the cat. They don't have to be friends. They just have to not chase the cat around and uh, pretty much ignore it. Type good at some types of things, but just keep in mind, most of your much larger, over 100 pound dogs, their lifespan starts shrinking pretty quick as you get bigger dogs, right? So to get a dog on a homestead, if you're starting with a puppy to like, this is the dog that does everything I need it to do. Realistically, you're looking at 18 to 24 months of training. So the dog's two years old when you get them to where you want them. And then it's like, how much life do I have left with this dog? If your dog lives 12 years old, I've got another decade of me and you working together and doing all this awesome stuff. So it's worth putting in the energy up front. If the dog's going to live six or eight years, that lives that, that short aren't going to be doing much work anyway. So I've got like four years and then I'm going to have to start spinning up another dog halfway through that. And you see how that just kind of snowballs to that. I'm not saying you can't do it or not to do it. It's just things to keep in mind uh, when you're going through things and then be aware. We just talked about breeds are created to do a thing, right? So if you have birds, then you probably want to be cautious about getting dogs who are bred historically to like put birds in their mouths like labradors now a labrador might do great or a labrador might be like hey dad i'm bringing you the birds like getting is if they in general the more they're bred to work the better a job they're going to do for you on your homestead but if you're still a strong working line retriever they want to go retrieve those birds for you right um you end up with a pointer on a on a homestead with a lot of birds and they just sit there like this all day like not doing anything else because there's birds there i'm pointing at them right so just keep those things in mind if i uh, have healers healers are going to be great if they're going to help me move my my uh, sheep and my goats around maybe not so great if what i prim primarily have is birds right so just kind of keep those things in mind when you when you come to the breed side of the house um you generally want a dog that's confident Enough energy to work, but maybe not so much that you can't in your life. Um, trainable for you. Now, I say trainable for you because what's trainable for you may not be trainable for somebody else and vice versa. I could take a Malinois and it moves fine for me and I go through cities and, and you know public and all that kind of stuff. And I don't have any problems. I have clients who will buy puppies and about every other year I get a puppy back because they just – they can't maintain the dog and I get the dog back and within three hours it's doing everything it's supposed to do. And I'm like, what's wrong? But for them, they couldn't manage that type of dog. Right. So uh, you want it to be trainable for you. Be cautious about the, what they call. High prey drive. So a high prey drive and there, there, this is obviously on a spectrum, right? This is like all on a spectrum and younger dogs will be more, uh, so the prey drive typically uh, is described by them wanting to chase things or grab things or, or pull and thrash on things, right? And, um, and that's more as a puppy typically, and it, it declines a little bit as they get older as a general rule. But um, those dogs are a lot harder to work around birds. So because the birds, the way that birds move is different than the way that sheep and goats and other livestock move. And they're just like, eat me, eat me. Hey, look, I'm going to do this thing. You want to eat me, right? And in the dog's mind, it's much more of a... And, uh, and so it takes a little bit more. So if you have that real high prey drive, that can be problematic as you're doing things. Um, terrier breeds can be hard when you're trying to herd things because terriers want to grab and thrash. That's what they were bred to do. They're thrashing dogs. And uh, so just be aware of that. Uh, mixed breeds we already talked about can be great. But if you're if you find somebody who's working a farm and he has a couple mixed breeds and you're like, those are awesome dogs and he just breeds them together. You might have a pretty good shot at getting a nice mixed breed dog for a homestead dog. If you go to a shelter, well, you don't know what you're getting. Right. Because you don't know where the parents are or what else. So it's just a bit of a gamble and just keep. You can take a hunting breed 
and train it to do homestead stuff. But what I don't recommend is if you want your dog to hunt for you, then you get dogs that hunt and that's what they do. If you want dogs that are protection dogs, you get them that are protection dogs and that's what they do. There may be a little bit of variation off of that, but they have purposes, right? The homestead dog is more of a broad type animal. And once you teach any animal to chase or kill other animals, it's very difficult to get them to distinguish between the animals they're allowed to chase and kill and the animals they're not allowed to chase and kill. The, the, uh, homestead dogs never chase or kill animals. Like they get corrected if they do that so that they stop doing it. It's not that they won't ever do it as a puppy, but they're not allowed to, right? And they're, it's communicated, never chase animals. So that would include things like if you have a large piece of property, um, letting them chase deer, squirrel, things like that. Like even if they're not hunting dogs, you want to break those uh, behaviors as well. You do not want them chasing animals if they're going to need to move well around livestock. All right, so let's jump into some of the stuff that I would train a homestead dog to do, and then we're going to talk through um, how I would do this. Uh, I would these topics, and you're like, well, how would you do that, or what about this nuance, or something like that? Let's interact there, and then once we run through a few of these, um, I want to know what other things you guys want to be able to teach a homestead dog to do, and we'll jump into some of those specifics. So now that we have the foundation laid, remember our process is create, control correct so whenever we want to teach the dog to do something new we have to create the environment for that to happen first then we control it so that it's safe and it's conducive for learning and then we correct as needed and then praise 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 is critical whenever you're using our method so we're taking away the treats and the toys so they don't have that as a reward so their reward is me going uh, look at it like this just on the praise side so usually guys are like oh good job and usually girls are a little bit more like they'll get in there. You, you give your level of praise, number one, based on how stressed the dog was doing the thing. So if it was a high stress thing, you get a lot more praise when it's done because, yeah, you did a good job, right? But I look at my praise like I would if I was training one of my sons to do something hard. I'm not going to go like all high pitch in my voice and I'm going, it's going to be more encouraging and like, yeah, you did a good job. Right. And so I just kind of keep that in mind when you're doing your praise. Okay. So you get a dog, even if you already have a dog and you're like, do we have property, but I've never really expected you to do anything. And now I want you to be my new homestead dog. Right. There's an intro process there. So for a lot of people, that intro process is probably going to be just starting basic obedience and going through that process. If you bring a dog home and you get it as a puppy, that's your ideal time to introduce it to all the livestock. And I get just enough obedience that it's not trying to drag me around on the lead. And then I start taking it around the livestock on a lead, on a correction collar. And if it does anything to the animals, it gets corrected. And so what I like to do is I use these leads here. And I clip it into my dog. And then I move with the dog through the animals like this. And I do that for a year with that dog, right? If I do take it off, I still have the lead on. And if, if they're doing a really good job just sitting and not doing anything, my off lead transition is I just unclip it and drop it on the ground. So I can still go grab it if I need to, right? The dog's not off leash, but you're gonna wanna do intro. So we introduce perimeter. So you want your dog to know this is the edge of the homestead. This is, now ideally you have a fence, right? If you don't have a fence, you're going to have to do to make way because what you don't want to do is get them in the habit of running away. And then once it's been established, it's a lot harder to break. So dogs are extremely pattern driven. And once they set a pattern, the longer that pattern goes, the longer it's going to take to break the pattern. So if they do something for six months, you're probably going to have to work for another six months to get that pattern out of them. If it happens for two days, then it's two or three days of work to get the pattern to break, right? So just watch dogs doing patterns. So you'll see this if you get your dog out of the car and you go into the house and your driveway, your little sidewalk goes up and turns left into the front door before you even get in the front door because that's where we go when we get out of the car, right? Well, if you do that 99.9% .9 of the time, then that's probably a pattern you want to allow the dog to have. But if 20% of the time you walk down that sidewalk and go do something else, 
I don't want my dog always shooting down the drive, the turn to the door, right? I want him staying with me, focused on me, paying attention to what it is we need to do next. So when I see that pattern, I start changing it up there so that they know, hey, this isn't a pattern. We got to I always got to look to my handler and see what are we doing here. So just be aware of that. So you're, you're going to start introducing them to the um, homestead and you're going to do your perimeter walks and outside the fence and things you don't get into, for instance, garden beds, right? So we have some raised garden beds that are only this high. I'm going to add another uh, plat to it because it's just low enough that the dogs just jump up into it without thinking. And it's just, um, it's down enough that you have to still lean over to do anything on it, right? So I'm like, all right, we need to raise that up a little bit. But when the dogs start to jump into there, I've got to show them, no, we don't jump on the beds, right? Because I'm going to have stuff in there that I don't want you pounding on. Now, the herb garden up front with the peppermint and the spearmint, roll in that all you want because that just makes everything smell great. But back here where I'm going to eat this stuff, no, 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 no. I start off with the pups pretty early. Um building suspicion in the dog now what is suspicion so if you want your dog to protect your animals from coyotes then when you see another dog and this this is not like we're going to send our dog to go fight with this dog right but i see another dog like a neighbor dog or even the neighbor themselves and i used to do this all the time with my young dogs is i'd walk outside and they look up and they notice hey there's a person over there right or there's a person and another dog over there and i would go what are they doing <laughs> who is that What's going on are they okay and you see the behavior that's she... right and it's your vocal and it's your body mannerism so you're not just standing there going who is it what are they doing right you're like who is it are they okay should we keep an eye on them i don't know girl what do you think and then once they get a little amped up like that i go good alert all right, I think they're okay. Let's go. And then we move on about our day. So it's like a 10, 15 second little ordeal. And then we move on. Now, what will happen though is the next time she sees somebody, she's going to be like, are they okay? And then I, I, I just encourage once they start naturally doing it themselves, good alert. Good alert. Yeah, I think they're okay, girl. We can just go and leave them alone. It's okay. Right. And, but I got alert. I encourage and praise for the alert. Now, I don't. what I don't want to do is this, though. Oh, good job, good job. Because now I'm breaking the attention off of the thing I want them to have their attention on. And they're like, oh, now I'm just going to pay attention to you and get all wiggly, right? So it's, it's a verbal praise, but it's like when you're teaching someone to shoot. Good shot. Do it again. Good shot. Do it again. It's not, oh, yeah, man, you did great. Like, let's give hugs while we're on the range. Like, we don't do that stuff. So when you're in that mentality with the dog, you don't break that mentality to go into lovey mode, right? So that's your building suspicion and general security. We're going to have a lot of demos and want some variation to it. Sometimes the dogs aren't as responsive, right? And you have to kind of build it up a little bit. And you may even be talking to a neighbor and go, Hey man, can you come over here and like shake my fence a little bit? And like, ah, fuck you, man. And then run off. And, uh, and because some dogs will need that, but that's very, very helpful. Right. <laughs> Make sure you know your neighbor really well. All right. So, um, pest and rodent control. We talked about this a little bit. Yes, ma'am. So once they come to the gate, it's a very good question. So then when we do, okay, yes. Then once you do suspicion drills and like you're looking at your neighbors across the street and you're making your dog suspicious, then when they come over, well, what do you do then, right? So when we do our protection training with our dogs, we have a thing called stability. Stability means you only bite when I tell you to bite, right? So I'm teaching you to bite on command, but then I have to communicate to the dog and they have to know you only do this if I tell you to do it. Unless I tell you or I'm physically attacked, you don't do it, right? And so there's a whole series of drills that we do to make that. So the simplified version of that when you're just building suspicion is when they come to the gate and the dog goes, they're here. The dog might even go, woof, woof, right? I go, and we walk up to the gate or maybe they're just you know on the sidewalk if we don't have a fence. And as I approach, I go, oh, I see it. They're okay, leave it alone. Not the dog barks again, fooey it. I said, leave it alone. They're okay. Now you're okay. Your vocal there is very important. So if you're like, uh, they're okay. 
The dog's like, you're not sure they're okay. So I'm not sure they're okay, right? So, and the other thing is, and usually the, you're not looking at this person who's a neighbor and being all cautious. Usually what it is is, well, now I've made my dog suspicious and now they're okay, they're okay. Really, really, they're okay, right? No, it's leave it home. Now, if I am a little concerned that they might lunge, I'm not getting any closer than this right now. Right. And I'm holding my lead. So if they decide they want to bark again or something like that, I can correct and they're safe and I'm safe and everything is good. And then even when I correct it, fooey that I said, leave it. Good. Leave it. They're fine. Leave them alone. So one of the things you have to remember in anything you do with the dogs, but it's more important when you get into the suspicion and the stability type stuff is if you make something a big deal, it becomes a big deal to the dogs. If you make something not a big deal, then it is not a big deal to the dog, right? So th this happens with my clients when we're doing protection training because they've got them, right? And then I say, put the dog at your side in a sit and tell them to leave it. Now, I'm still wearing equipment. They were just biting me in this equipment and I did not go to the hospital. So you know it's safe or as safe as it can be for them even if they fail and bite me. So they, the thing you have to teach them is relax. If they fail, this is where you want it to happen. You want them to mess up here so you can correct it and then you won't mess up in public, right? So when you you have neighbors and things like that, I would, especially if you have good relationships and they're coming over and talking to you and stuff like that, is I would let them know, hey, suspicious when she first sees somebody and then when I tell her it's okay, we want her to be friendly. So would you help me with that? exercise for a few minutes and then they know they're standing there and there's a purpose to what's going on and yeah and you can relax and they can relax because you've taken the safety measures to make sure that nobody's going to get hurt right and when you're starting with a young dog they will bark they will growl 99.9% .9 of dogs will not engage with a human unless they have been trained to do so even if they will initially put their teeth on if the person is comes back into the fight they're like never mind i thought it would work like i'm out of here right they're actually engaging and causing serious injury even if they're barking and stuff is fairly low but still be very cautious with it when i have the the lead i either usually have it on me like this depending on how big and strong the dog is um where i know that it's not going to slip out of my hand or i just have a good grip on it with both hands right the other thing to be aware of is the lead we didn't get a lot into communication yesterday but your lead is one of your primary forms of communication with the dog. So if I want my dog to wait, a lot of times I just bump back on the lead. They get a little bump, it goes loose, and they know that means wait, right? But you also communicate to the dog like this. I'm walking with my dog. And my person that I'm now I'm a little nervous that maybe my dog's going to do something they're not supposed to. And I go, so if the dog's like this, I say, tension, it's okay leave it alone. Don't do anything. And the dog's going, why are you so tense? Because normally my lead is not tight and now it is. So you have to be aware that you're in it because we tend to do this, right? We tend to tense up when that kind of stuff happens. And then we take all that slack out of that lead because we think, well, if I have tension in the lead, my dog won't lunge and hurt the person. Have a little slack because you can still catch them do all it tight because that communicates to the dog something's not right here, especially if you've been practicing your loose lead and you don't normally have tension in the lead, right? So, but they we kind of say it, it sounds a little frou frou, but the dogs just sense it is your emotions go down the lead to the dog, right? And but most of that is because you're physically doing things that the dog is detecting through the lead and they respond to how you are. So if you're calm and everything's okay, they'll be calm. But that's why also when you wanna build suspicion, you've actually gotta, who is that, right? Because they feed off that too. And it's back and forth, back and forth. Turn the switch on, turn the switch off. Does that? All right, and we can come back, yeah. Yeah. Correct. Well, if you let that go on for a long time, you're stupid. 
right? So the point that, so the question, the, the initial idea was 99.9% .9 of the time dogs won't engage, right? And, and then the concern is, well, if you let that continue to go on, they'd be 100% correct. The purpose of that statement is when you're doing your initial introductions, the chances of something going really bad are really low. And if you've got a dog that's like showing real solid, like then find a trainer and be like, okay, help me with this so we can fix this. So that's not a problem. Right. But if your dog's just kind of going like, as you're walking near somebody, first of all, I'm not going to keep approaching if that's happening. Right. I'm going to take a few steps and then they go, I stop and I go, fooey it, leave it. It's okay. Relax. They're fine. And maybe the first time we meet, this is as close as we get. Right. And I, and, and as long as the, if we actually have to do something together, then I'll go, let me go put the dog up and we'll do our stuff. And then tomorrow we'll see if we can get a couple steps closer. And then when you'll realize once the person comes over a few times, the dog gets over it. So if you allow the behavior of woofing and uncomfortable and I'm not relaxing and leaving it when you say, if you let that keep going, it will get worse. That's why we say it never comes out of nowhere. The dog's been telling you for a while it was going to do something if it does it. But what we want to be aware of is, the very beginning, especially if we're starting our dogs young, the chances of something bad happening are really low as long as we have a good grip on our lead. And so relax so that the dog's not getting the stroke. Something's wrong with my person and I need to figure out what it is and see if there's something I can do about it. Whereas if you're like, easy, everything's great. And they're like, oh, well, even if I'm uncomfortable, at least they're not uncomfortable. So maybe everything is okay. And then after a couple of exposures to it, they go, Nothing bad's happened, so I guess it's okay. And they get more and more comfortable as you go through. So I appreciate that statement. All right, so um, interactions with livestock. What I want my homestead dogs to do is ignore the livestock unless I specifically tell them to do something, right? So you guys have, a lot of you... I'm not going to kill a bird, right? So in those beginning stages and for quite a while, it's your job is to just leave these birds alone. And we're going to get into some predator assistance and stuff like that um, that we would do. But their job with the livestock initially is don't mess with it. And if you push into this too fast, you usually end up with some dead livestock. And the more dead livestock you get, the harder it becomes to get them to not keep trying to eat the livestock. So never get a taste for it. That's ideal. If they do, I want a good correction associated with it. And then I want to have a good length of time where that doesn't happen again as they get stabilized, right? So there's feathers and hooves. That's your two types of livestock that our dogs are watching over, right? Hooves generally tend to be easier. The main thing you don't want your dog to do is to be chasing them because they chase them and they do one of two things. They either turn and butt the dog back or they run. And if in either one of those, the dog might decide, hey, this is fun. We can have this fight. Like, let's tussle. Or they go, this is really fun. I get to chase these things all over the field. This is awesome. And then they want to do it more and more. So again, I take them out on lead. I move around the animals. The first couple times you do this, your animals are probably going to be a little uncomfortable with this new thing that's there that they're not used to. So I want them to get used to the dog. And I want the dog to get used to them. Right. But their main job is ignore them. And then once you start to get that ignoring thing going on, then you start teaching the dog to watch over the herds, which we'll talk a little bit about when we get into the, the predator stuff a little bit more. But that's the second step after they ignore and leave them alone. And um, so when you're doing feathers, what I like to do is, depending on how many you have, the, the more, the better actually. If you have a smaller uh, flock, that's just fine too, is I go into a confined space with the birds. So if you have like a shed, then, you know, you walk in with the dog. The very time you do this, if you have zero obedience in your dog, this probably isn't going to be successful, right? So I need enough obedience that I can go walk at my side. We use the command foos and I walk somewhere and I go, wait, sit, good sit. Now, if you, once you have that level of training, you can start introducing them to birds. Because when I walk into their space, I walk in and the dog's like, oh my goodness, what's this? And I go, leave it alone, sit. 
good sit. Now they're going to probably sit for a second. And then fui it sit, right? Your job is to sit. I don't care that these other things are in here. You sit. And then as you do that day after day, when you go to take care of the birds, they the pattern driven, right? They know, okay, I come in and I sit and I watch my person do their stuff. And, um, and then as the, once the, you're comfortable with that, then you can start moving them around a little bit more with the birds, right? Keeping a close eye on them because if they want to try and grab them, you want to correct that pretty quick. And then I start leaving them in a position while I move around and I've dropped the lead at this point, but they have to earn that, right? And if you have a question whether they'll do it or not, I'd probably go a little longer before you do it because failure is a big setback when it comes to, but that's food and I know it now because I ate one of them, right? So if you can avoid that, that's your best bet to avoid that. Um, also use e-collars if you want your dogs roaming more. And Jack's talked about this on the show before. So I take the same approach with the e-collar and livestock as Nick Ferguson takes with fencing and goats, right? If that thing goes off, and now this is for this specific purpose. There's other purposes that we wouldn't do it to this level. But when it comes to livestock, if you go after one of those livestock, they will electrocute you to death, right? And so they go, they get closer than I'm comfortable with. And as soon as they get within that range that in their mind, I want them to go electricity arcs to you from that point. If you're that close to the end. And I just, I start off and I just go, bam. And you'll see them kind of. Now, if the first interaction is I'm going to go chase, I just hit the continuous and hold it down until they stop chasing, right? And you need to make sure, depending on your dog, if you have a dog that's highly pain tolerant, then you need a good, high quality e collar to do this training. If you have most other dogs, you give them a, a continuous three second ride on an e collar and they start going, arr, 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 and then as soon as they stop chasing, I just stop. Right. And then the animals are usually kind of running away at the same time because they're a little startled, too. And then I just watch in that situation. What I is I want to be associated with the correction the dog is receiving for going after the livestock, because if I'm going to have the dog out there unattended, then if they're doing what she did the other day, which is. Maybe I can get that bird, but maybe they're still watching me. And so she's looking to see, right, if, if, because she's already associating, oh, yeah, if you tell me to do something, there's a lead and I'm going to get a correction. But when they look around and you're not there, and then they go and do the thing and they get shocked, now you're not the one who did it, right? The animal did it. And holy crap, like that electric bird just shocked up out of me. I don't want to mess with these birds anymore, right? And you can do the same thing with the, the hoofed animals. So that, that's your two options is on lead. And you can do them both interchangeably. It's not like a one or the other. It's a, when you're moving with me, this is how we move. And then it's a, when I let you outside with the animals, this is how you behave. Now, when you do the outside stuff, don't just put the e-collar on, let them outside, watch them for five minutes and go, I guess they're doing a pretty good job and then go do other things. Right. So you, if you have five minutes to dedicate that day, you watch them for five minutes. Maybe they do it. Maybe they don't. I step out. I call them back in and they're not out with the birds unattended anymore. Right. I can give five minutes another day. We do that. And the more time you can give at any one time, the faster you'll get it. But just work it into your schedule as you have the ability. Right. All right. Um, so some people have asked, what about checking ahead of you for snakes and things like that? There's a couple different ways you can. They call it snake proof your dog. Um, I use the same method that we use for don't mess with the birds, right? So we'd get like a rubber snake on like a 50 or 60 foot piece of fishing line. And we put it out somewhere. We're going to walk by it. And I have somebody off on the side. And as we get close, they start pulling it through the grass, right? So the dog's like, well, what's that? And then I don't say anything. Let the dog like go check it out. And as soon as they get close, I just go pow. And they're like, whoa. And I'm like, oh, we should probably leave that alone, buddy. And if they go for it again, pow. And then they see things moving in the grass. And guess what they do? They go, uh-uh. Like that stuff shocks you. Just stay away from it. Now, if you have a terrier or something that you want to take those kinds of things out, then you don't need to do that. But just understand uh, snake bites are, are dangerous for dogs. And 
some of them can get bit and they get sick and they recover and then they're fine from that point on and some of them it kills. So um, if you want more information on that, we can go more into that uh, offline and there will be a, a bigger section on the thing, but I didn't want to waste too much time on it here. Bad bird and other. So we're basically using the same technique we use to create suspicion of the other people, but we're doing it with whatever it is we want them to be suspicious with. Now, the good thing here is I don't need to stabilize my dog with hawks. Right. If that hawk actually comes down here, you grab it if you can. Right. And so we're doing the same thing. Only what? So it's the vocal. What is that? What's it doing up there? You keep an eye on it, boy. And I also move like depending on how big the property is. I like track the hawk. Like we follow the hawk to see what's it going to do. Now, once I hit the edge of my property, then I'm like, OK, what well, left? It's gone. Right. Or if it purchased. The truth, then I may walk up and actually like keep building some suspicion, grab some sticks and things and throw them at them. And I want the dog to know like, we don't like that thing. It needs to leave. Right now. I may, I may not be able to actually get it to leave, but I want the dog to know like, freaking, I got my eyes on you. Like you don't mess with us. Right. So we, you can build suspicion that way. That does take a little bit longer time. Um, you can aid a little bit by setting up things where they have a reward where you get like a black bird and you, you, you act like you're, you're going after a hawk, but you have a black bird hidden. It's already dead, by the way. It's, it's there for food today. And throw stuff at the hawk, and then I take that bird and I throw it up there, and I watch where it lands, and I go, we got it. We go over, and they get to eat that bird. And they go, oh, not only is it a bad bird, but it tastes good too. And so I'm definitely keeping an eye on these things. So those are a few little things you can do with that. When it comes to coyotes and that sort of thing, yes. One thing on the bad bird. Yeah. One thing on the bad bird. A lot of you guys live where you have a hell of a lot more vultures and buzzards than you do hogs. Mm -hmm. A bad bird for him is any large bird up in the air. Correct. And you get a lot more opportunity to do the type of thing if you do that. Yeah, you don't have to wait for a hawk. The any big bird in the air that would be big enough that it, if it was going to come down and harm my animals, it, it's big enough to do so. That's a bad bird. Right. So very good. I appreciate that. When we start talking about things like raccoons and possums, generally dogs will automatically want to chase those. And so if I see them chasing them and be cautious that they're not actually chasing your livestock. Right. But if I see a dog going after those, I just let them go after it. And I even encourage it. The one that can get dangerous is starting to teach dogs to be suspicious over coyotes. Okay. So there's, there's multiple issues with coyotes. Now there are some dogs who are, I refer to them as anti-dog dogs. These are the mauler breeds, the livestock guardian dogs. These dogs are bred for the purpose of killing other canine species, right? And they're really good at it. So you don't take a Malinois or a German shepherd or a Dutch shepherd and put them up against an anti-dog dog because those dogs are anti-human dogs. They are not anti-dog dogs, right? So they're different categories of how they fight. So if you have an anti-dog dog, these are Rottweilers, Mountain Curs, um, any of the catch dogs, right? The ones that hunt pigs and catch them and hold on to them. Any of those dogs, any of your livestock guardian dogs, these dogs are all strong and, and powerful enough to kill coyotes pretty quickly. So, But a coyote and a German Shepherd, a similar body structure. And sometimes coyotes are all by themselves. And sometimes they are not. People tend to have this idea that coyotes are solitary and they're always by themselves. If you ever hear, if you ever heard a coyote pack, you know they are not by themselves. And you send even one or two dogs, even your bigger dogs that are designed for that, they can still get messed up if a pack is there. So you definitely don't want to send a Malinois out there for that kind of stuff. So what I want most of the time, if I have coyote problems, you probably need to get an actual LGD and that dog is for that purpose right? What I want is for my dogs to alert me. Hey, there's something over there, a bark, a growl. And then it, uh, when I say alert for the pointy ear dogs, and you can see it a little bit in the, the dogs that ears are fully up, but if you're not paying attention, it, it's not always as easy to tell, but they take their ears and they point them forward. So they're, they're focused on all the sound is coming from that direction. They're hyper-focused. They almost always have their mouth closed, even if it's hot, right? So they're they will close that mouth. They will focus in and their ears will go forward. And even if one is turning, they might hear something. One ear turns, but the other ear stays in the direction they're looking, right? That is an alert. 
And if they do that, especially don't ignore it because I want to know what are you alerting on? And so I look and I see what are they alerting on? And then I either go, oh, that's okay. Leave it alone. Or I go, what is that? Yeah, pay attention to it, right? And I encourage and develop that. So for coyotes, I do not recommend, unless you have a dog that's bred for that purpose, that you let your dogs go interact with coyotes. Another thing that I have seen coyotes do is in the pack, they will take a female in heat and they will send her out to a dog and she will flirt and she will wag her little tail at him and he'll be like, hey, baby. And she's like, hey, you want to come back to my she takes them on back over to the wood and six or eight coyotes will come out and kill that dog because coyotes eat other dogs. And so just be aware of that safety wise. That's a, a big deal. All right. Perimeter and keeping your dog on the homestead. This is a little bit more nuanced, right? So I, ideal situation, chain link or some kind of like a cattle panel or, or hog panel type uh, fencing. And don't, uh, if the dog does jump, then we want to uh, encourage them not to jump, right? We're going to walk the perimeter and correct them if they try to jump on the fence. But most dogs, if you have a fence and they haven't been trained to jump the fence, will stay in the fence. If they start getting out of the fence, uh, my number one go-to is get an invisible fence. So they're cheaper than putting in a whole perimeter because it's basically a wire that you're running. And, uh, and Nicole said, I haven't checked these out yet, but she was telling me yesterday, the day before they make ones now that you can program GPS coordinates on for your property. And then the, the collar knows if it's outside of that perimeter and it will correct for that. So that's even, you don't even have to lay a wire for those. Now I haven't used those. I haven't seen how accurate they are to the actual dimensions on the ground and stuff, but that's another option, right? And that way, again, you're not associated with it. So if you want your dog to be let out, but to stay on those are your two best bets e either putting in a perimeter fence or using some kind of a collar that alerts them to hey you're not supposed to be out here right now the old style um, electric fences the invisible fences just had a if you're within this range it, it was like at six feet it would buzz at three feet it would shock them but if they ran through it it would shock them for the three feet on the other side it would buzz and then it would stop the newer fences you create a closed loop and then if they're outside that loop it just keeps going until they get back inside. So a couple of things that are important to understand is you need to introduce the dog to that perimeter. Don't just wait for them to do it because they don't know initially, why am I getting the perimeter? I typically want to do this with a longer lead, which if you need a long line and you don't use it very often, just go to Walmart, buy a rope, wear gloves if you're going to let it run through your hands so they don't burn your hands and tie a clip to the end of that, clip it onto their lead or their collar and just go, hey, let's go for a walk. And then as they go where they're not supposed to go, they start getting shocked, but I can make sure they don't bolt in that direction because I have the lead, right? And if they don't come back and figure it out quickly on their own, I just pull them back in. And as soon as they're back where they're supposed to be, it stops. And I go, okay. And you walk the perimeter a couple of times doing that and they learn that's the line right there. Like don't pass that line or bad things start to happen do them you walk that perimeter with them and then after that they're pretty much they understand what's going on the other thing to keep in mind with any of the collars that use the e-technology right that give us stun or an actual shock is fur is extremely resistant to conducting electricity so the collars have to be on tight enough that they actually go through the fur and rest on the skin and the prongs have to be long enough that for that dog's fur it gets through to the skin. So for like her short prongs and you just put it on and I just shift it back and forth a few times to kind of make sure it works through the fur. And then it's good as long as it's tight enough. A dog that has really thick fur, you might have to get like those inch probes so that they go through the fur and will actually rest touching the skin. And you can do that too. And, and the other thing is anytime you're using e-technology is it goes on they wear it for some period of time. I like to say at least a week. And then it starts getting used. And then it stays on until I haven't needed it for at least a month. And so that doesn't mean you can't take it off at night to charge it or something like that. But that is one of your everyday wear collars. If you're doing anything outside the crate or a kennel. And you wear that every day until I don't need it anymore. Because what you don't want them to do is go, I got a collar on. I have to behave. Oh, the collar's off. I want to associate the understanding of this is the caller that's creating this. Yes, did you have Can a question? Can I say something on that? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. So the question is, if you're using the e-collar, they've been good for the month. I went ahead and took it off and then they, they broke and did the thing they weren't supposed to. So I go e-collar back on. It's a, right. So I go e-collar goes back on. Now you're going to wear it for two months before it comes off. And then probably if they do that to me one time, I get the little fake boxes. They make these, they, they are a lot cheaper, but there's no electronics in them so that if they do get damaged or broken, you're not out much money. And once I take the, the other collar off, if, if they've been good, they still get this one back on so that they still feel like they have that on. Because most of the time, if they do that, they've figured out in their brain a little bit that, hey, there's something here and maybe it's not here anymore. So, and sometimes they will just forget. Like I've, I used bark collars myself, but especially when we were in like two acre neighborhoods and so they stop barking outside well they they haven't barked in like a month right and they're just up they're chilling on top of their dog houses they're watching the yard and everything and a moose walks into the yard and i was actually watching my malinois on her house when this happened and she went woof <sighs> okay because she just she forgot right and she gave the bark but then she was like oh shit i should have done that okay okay it's good everything's good right so there's a little bit of that that can play into that too and so I, I just be aware of it. And, you know, some people just decide, hey, you just wear the e-collar for a while. And if, if you end up finding yourself going back and forth, then you're taking it off too soon. You, they need for the Add-on, if you're using the e-collar to keep LGDs in the perimeter, um, you can't take it off at night. So you just plan to have double by double so you yes. can have one charging and one on. Yep. And, and you need high quality ones if you're doing that too, because the, so when people ask, well, what's a good quality e-collar? Most of the e-collars out there nowadays are pretty good at doing the e-collar thing. Meaning I push a button, it gives us stimulus, right? That isn't, there's not much variation in that where the variation comes from is how high a quality is the housing. Meaning if they bang into a tree, is it going to break and fall off the collar? And because if, if they're going to, if they're hunting dogs, for instance, and they're running through streams and ponds and things like that, and it's getting all muddy and wet and everything else, is it still going to work? Right. So most of your cheap ones, that's where they break. It's the elements. So if you have livestock guardian dogs that are out in the elements all the time, even if they're not in like standing water, but it's raining and all this other kind of stuff, make sure you have one that's a high enough quality to, to withstand that. Yes, sir. perimeter fence collar for yep. uh, my great Pyrenees. And if I don't put it on tight enough, then it doesn't have the effect that I need. And Correct. what seems to happen is after a month or two of keeping it on tight enough to have contact, he'll get infected. So Usually if they're getting an infection is because they're, they're getting shocked. So she's probably testing it. Testing. Right. And, uh, and so we call that like a burn. So what I'll do when they're doing that. So there's a couple different types of e-collars. The bark collars have to be right in the center because they have, they have a third little probe that sticks out that actually detects the vibration of the bark when the dog barks. So it has to be in that spot or it doesn't function 100%. The rest of your collars can be anywhere on the dog's neck and it works. So what I do in those situations is every time I go out to feed the dogs, I always want to interact with my dog just a minute so that they know I'm, I'm good. I pack collar and shift it a couple of inches. And, I, and that way it's just shifting around on their neck and then i keep an eye now if they if once it's infected you generally have to take it off wash the collar because it's got nasty in it too and then um the what's the jack just walked out but that he has on t-spaz this spray stuff that's like uh herbs mixed with peroxide all right i'd never used Zy that before Zycam or something yes like i think that's it Zycam. so if, if jack remembers he can put it in the show notes but um that stuff, so our dogs on tie out sometimes when it gets wet, they'll get the water stays in a, hot, a run and switch another dog out, right? So when that kind of stuff happens, it happened fairly recently after I just gotten it. I'm like, well, I'm gonna give this stuff a try. Like I've never messed with it. Normally it would take three to four days for the fur to all grow back in, you know, it gets uh, well and the fur all grows back in. I squirted that stuff on there. First of all, she didn't act like, whoa, that burns. And then it was a day and a half before I went to check on her again. It was not only was it gone, but the fur was grown back in and everything. So that stuff is awesome. So we were just talking about the, the spray disinfectant that you recommend. Is it Zycam? Zymox. 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 
Yes, it's on tspaz.com. And using it on the dog's perspective, that was the fastest I'd ever seen him heal from a collar uh, hotspot. And um, so the same thing would happen with the, the probes. And be aware that anytime you're using an e-collar, especially if you're using it for any length of time, if you have to use it a lot, it can create little burns and then those can get infected. So you, you've got to keep an eye on that, not overuse it in one, any one area. Okay. That's, that's probably a possibility. So um, – Number one, we're talking about homestead dogs, right? We want to try and avoid dogs that have a lot of allergy problems. Now, maybe that's the only allergy problem that they have. But if you have a dog, that dog is going to suffer its whole life from allergy problems. Now, they do make shots. And there's a couple different ones, anywhere from like every six weeks to every six months that they give these shots to the dogs and it, it helps them out. Um, so there's a couple things. You can do all of this training without an e-collar. It just takes more work. Like all of the training, like I almost never use e-collars personally, except for very specific applications. But there's a lot of people who do distance training with their dogs with an e-collar because it's a lot faster because I don't have to stop and walk to the dog and correct the dog and put them back where they're supposed to be and walk back and start. The I like the long-term results better of doing that with the prong collar than using the e-color. So you can do all of this without a prong color. One thing they may be able to do is get an anodize on it. And I would look into that. And even if you have to pay somebody to anodize, like if you're going to get them anodized, you're probably paying for the guy to like set it up. So I would buy like four or five extra sets because they usually unscrew the little probes. So you can usually, in most companies that make them, you can buy extra probes and sometimes different lengths of probes. So buy yourself a couple extra sets if you're going to do this and go in and have them all done because they're just covering the tip with a, a, so whatever the anodizing. I think it's aluminum uh, typically. So, but if you just can't do it, then you just can't do it. I mean, um, you know, I, one of the big things that we try to do is make sure that our lines don't have allergies. And when we find dogs that do, they don't get bred. So, because that is, that's more and more of a problem in the dog world. Yeah. All right. Any other questions on that? Yeah, yes, sir. Different question. So I've got a, an embarrassing confession. We've Tonight, all done it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish that were true. So I have a great Pyrenees. Okay. Who uh, we, we bought him after he was weaned. He had lived with his mother in pasture. And I, he stayed with us in the house for a few months until he was big enough. And then also I got some sheep, put him out there and I've got great fence, okay. uh, six strand, high tensile, electrified, the uh, 80 jewels. Nick, wherever you're at, like you'll lose control of your bladder if you touch my fence. Okay. Uh, but I kept having problems with sheep having an ear chewed off. And the dog has never been aggressive with a human ever. You know, my two-year-old would just literally body slam him. He didn't care. He loved right. it. And I've never seen him shape, chase the sheep. I've never, he's never growled the sheep. He will kind of hurt a little bit. Mm -hmm. and, and But I'll come right. out and he's got a sheep down. Okay. And it's almost as if he's just playing with the sheep like it was his chew toy. How old is the dog now? Uh, he's a year and a half. Okay, so still pretty young. And so dog. my temporary temporary solution was to put him on a chain. Mm -hmm. And so he's on a chain and he's with the sheep. I rotate him every three days just like they do. So it's not like he's laying in a cage or something. Right. And so he's got, you know, fresh dirt to dig and stuff. And anytime I'm in the pasture, I'll let him off the chain so I yep. can watch him. Never does he even look act like he notices the sheep. Yeah, I've got an e-collar, but I haven't used it yet, but I've got it just thinking that, you know, I, when I'm out there, I'll have it on him. And think, yep. What the hell? Like he never, it's not yeah. an attack situation. It's just like he likes to cuddle with them and chew their ears off. And there's a couple of things that, that could be happening there. One is, um, so what, what dogs will do if there's a couple of dogs just hanging out and laying around is they'll groom each other. Right. And so he may have started finding like some, you know, some ticks or some kind of other parasite on the ears. And he started trying to fix them. And then he nipped the ear and got that taste for blood. Yeah. So there's a couple things you could try. There's what is it? Bitter apple. There's a there's a liquids that you can get. And this is going to be a little bit of extra work depending on how many sheep you have. But you just go and just spray all their ears once a day. 
with that so that if he puts his mouth on it now some dogs don't care but most dogs don't like it so that's one option the the e-collar could work but that's going to be like you're literally out there with night vision at night watching him and going nah and knock that shit off (laughs) yeah so you know then you'd want to get up a couple hours before that and actually go out and and because what you don't you can you know give him a pop when you walk out and find him that way and some dogs will connect that and so you can try it that way if pooped in the house while you were gone but he did it that morning an hour after you left he totally forgot he pooped in the house he doesn't know what's going on so if you just come home and yell at him and kick him and throw him out the front door he doesn't have a clue he just knows well every time they come home i get kicked and thrown out the front door like i guess it's just my (laughs) life right so some dogs if you grab them and take them to their poop and show it to them and then correct them will connect it and some dogs won't so yeah so if if that's what I would, I would show him, correct, and then give him his whatever. If you're using a prong, you can prong correct. If you're using an e-collar, you can e-collar correct. The scolding is very effective. And, that is, and I, you were here two days ago, but when, you, when we give correction, it's very harsh, at least from a tone perspective. Fooey that. Knock that shit off. Don't ever do that again. And then it's good. Leave it. So you can't stay mad, right? It's give the correction, show them what they did was wrong, and now it's over. So when a dog is aggressive or something like that, I tell people, correct them until you feel better. And then so you can actually let it go, right? If you still feel like they needed more, you're probably going to have a harder time letting it go. So the correction is hard, but then when it's over, it's over. And another thing you could try is go out, find them out there before anything has started. And just walk him around to the sheep and praise him for not hurting the sheep. So that then if you do need to correct when you come out and find him hurting a sheep, there's two different situations now. There's the situation where he comes out and he's happy with me. And there's a situation where he comes out and he's not happy with me. Now, the one thing is this has probably become a pattern too. So however long that pattern has been going on, you're probably going to have to be diligent with it for a fairly decent length of time to break the pattern because if you if you do like the bitter apple and it's working great for a month but he's been doing this for six months and then you're like okay he's doing so good i'm gonna stop and then as soon as you stop he does it again and some of the some of the old farmers have said oh he's got a taste for him he's done you just need to get rid of him it's over it, it's it depends. uh i don't know is that true uh, and, and but like i said even when he was a puppy in our yard mm-hmm. he wouldn't even chase the chickens like yeah. any dog will do. He just, he's not that aggressive kind of dog. Right. So for months I would come out and there'd be a new sheep with no ear. I'd be like, fuck. Now the I other, thought, I thought I had a varmint sneaking in. I would, try the bitter apple I would, I would try the bitter apple first. That would be my first step. The other thing that I would literally have to ask myself when I know this sounds kind of cruel and mean, but is like, well, is it hurting? Then like, it's not a big deal. Right. But does the sheep act like it's in pain when he's messing with them? I see so i'm like if he's never injuring them any other way yeah so infections yeah and i mean we used to to do not me personally but i worked on a ranch with a lot of cattle and when we would do castrations they just had whatever that disinfectant hardcore spray was and they would literally like lift the leg cut it pull all the nasty out spray it and let them go and they, they never got infected so bad it was a problem. So, there, I mean, there's different things you can do, but I would just start with the bitter apple. And then if that does, then yes, sir. On the same topic, are we positive that it's the dog that's doing it? Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you've done that. <clears throat> and there was never any uh, evidence of a predator or a farmer. Okay, we're at time. Gotcha. Okay, good deal. If you guys have any other questions or other topics that you want to discuss, um, you feel free to get with me offline while we're here. And this and a lot more will end up being on the um, the Canine Academy. So you guys can always reach out to me. I just took my picture up there and I'll get all my info on that contact information. So if you guys want to do that later, uh, you can. And don't forget, you can check us out at Fortress.us. So thank you very much, guys. All right. Thank you so much, Joel. I appreciate it. We've got about a 15 minute break and then we are meeting Jack. Jack, where are we meeting Jack? Yeah. Also, Hawkeye would like.